Well, breaking news. Welcome to 1974. This is what living through high speed history feels like. 50 years ago, a Republican president of the United States was under investigation and the federal courts in Washington, D.C. responded accordingly and appropriately. The courts worked faster than we had ever seen them work before. The breaking news of tonight is that the United States Supreme Court took only five hours this afternoon to decide to fast track Special Prosecutor Jack Smith's request that the Supreme Court intervene now and decide Donald Trump's appeal in the case of United States of America versus Donald J. Trump. Donald Trump appealed a decision by the trial court judge, Tanya Chutkin, in which Judge Chutkin denied Donald Trump's claim of complete immunity from criminal charges for any conduct during his time as president of the United States and his claim that he was immune from prosecution in the January 6th case because Donald Trump's lawyers say that that would be double jeopardy because Donald Trump already was subjected to an impeachment trial in the United States Senate on essentially the same charges. Last week, this appeal by Donald Trump seemed like business as usual in the federal court system with the United States Court of Appeals in Washington, D.C. having jur jurisdiction over the Trump appeal with an unlimited amount of time to consider that appeal. And as I complained on this program last week, the appeals court could take a year to decide an appeal like that if they wanted to. And after the appeals court decision came down, the losing side was surely going to appeal to the United States Supreme Court, which could then take, who knows, another year. Jack Smith decided not to play that game. At 12.30 p.m. today, Jack Smith filed a petition directly to the United States Supreme Court, asking the Supreme Court to use its power to reach down and take this case off of the appeals court docket for immediate consideration by the Supreme Court. At the same time, Jack Smith filed a backup motion with the appeals court to expedite the appeal at the appeals court level if the Supreme Court refuses to take the case at this stage. And just five hours later, the Supreme Court responded favorably to Jack Smith. And a half hour after that, the Court of Appeals responded favorably to Jack Smith. The United States Supreme Court issued an order saying the court granted Jack Smith's request to consider taking the case on an expedited basis. The Supreme Court has not decided to take the case, but has decided to consider Jack Smith's argument that the Supreme Court should take the case. The Supreme Court then gave Donald Trump's lawyers until next Wednesday, December 20th at 4 p.m., to file a reply brief to Jack Smith's brief that was submitted to the Supreme Court today. And the United States Court of Appeals which still has jurisdiction over the case until and unless the Supreme Court decides to take the case at this stage, issued an order to Donald Trump's lawyers saying that their reply to Jack Smith's request to the appeals court is due this Wednesday, the day after tomorrow, at 10 a.m. And in his petition to the Supreme Court, Jack Smith reminded the court of just how quickly the Supreme Court is capable of working. Quote, the district court overseeing one of the Watergate cases had scheduled trial to begin on September 9th, 1974. On May 24th, 1974, the special prosecutor sought certiorari before judgment following the district court's denial of former President Nixon's motion to quash a subpoena seeking Oval Office recordings. The court granted certiorari a week later and set the case for argument on July 8th, 1974. The decision issued 16 days later, and the trial began in the fall of 1974. Jack Smith showed the Supreme Court in that example that the Nixon case, one of the reasons they acted as fast as they did was to preserve the criminal trial schedule of the Watergate defendants in Washington, D.C. Jack Smith asked the Supreme Court and the appeals court today to expedite the appeal to help preserve the trial date currently scheduled for March 4th in this case. Rule 11 of the United States Supreme Court says that an appeal can bypass the Court of Appeals and go directly to the United States Supreme Court 
quote, upon a showing that the case is of such imperative public importance as to justify deviation from normal appellate practice and to require immediate determination in this court. Jack Smith uses that key phrase, imperative public importance, multiple times in his petition to the Supreme Court, beginning on the first page of his argument. And on page 10, Jack Smith writes, this case involves a paradigmatic issue of imperative public importance, the amenability to criminal prosecution of a former president of the United States to conduct to conduct undertaken during his presidency. It requires no extended discussion to confirm that this case involving charges that respondent sought to thwart the peaceful transfer of power through violations of federal criminal law is at the apex of public importance. The charges implicate a central tenet of our democracy, and the charges allege that respondent conspired to transgress the law in manifold ways by intentionally using fraudulent means to obstruct the presidential electoral process by obstructing constitutionally prescribed processes in Congress for counting electoral votes and by seeking to deprive millions of voters of their electoral choice for president. Professor Tribe, we begin uh, with you tonight with all of your experience as a uh, practitioner before the Supreme Court and a very successful one. Uh, Please set for us where we are tonight in Supreme Court history. How rare is this kind of intervention request to the Supreme Court? Uh, How often does the Supreme Court uh, respond within hours to such a request? Uh, where are we now in the history of this story? We are on a very fast track, Lawrence. In the 1940s, as I researched it, there were only two cases, one of which involved the Nazi saboteurs, in which the court moved to leapfrog the Court of Appeals and consider a case straight out of the trial court. In the 1950s, There was only one such case involving Truman's seizure of the steel mills. I couldn't find any such cases in the 1960s. There was one in the 1970s. You've described it, the Nixon tapes case. Uh, In the 1980s, there were two, one of them involving the Iran hostage crisis. I haven't found any in the 1990s. And in the 2000s, the pace has picked up. There have been five or six. It's not quite as extraordinary now. The court is picking up its pace. But the net result is that Jack Smith trumped Trump. And it is going to consider this case without doubt once the former president responds by 4 p.m. nine days from now, a week from Wednesday, um, urging that it not take the case. He really won't have any good arguments about why it should wait for the Court of Appeals. They will almost certainly decide to hear the case on an expedited schedule. It will be resolved in all certainty, very little doubt, uh, in time for Jack Smith's trial before Tanya Chutkin to begin on March 4th. So we are watching history in the making, and it's on fast boil. Uh, Andrew Weissman, the the argument that the Trump lawyers are facing or about to have to make is not on the merits of the case. It's on why this should not be decided now. They have to say to the Supreme Court, uh, you should not decide this issue now And here's why you shouldn't decide it now. I don't know how to fill in the next sentence about about why the Supreme Court shouldn't decide it now. Well, I agree with you. I mean, I think I think given that they have already told the district court that they are being harmed every single day, every hour by the fact of being under indictment, based on the two legal theories they're putting forth, presidential immunity and double jeopardy, I think it makes it 
truly impossible to come up with any coherent argument. And so they have a very steep um, hill to climb with respect to that part of the argument. And as Professor Tribe said, on the merits, which is the double jeopardy claim and the presidential immunity claim, the double jeopardy claim is, I mean, that's just beyond a loser. I mean, that there, there's just, it's just not grounded in the law. Um, it, it's, they're just, he, he's not been tried twice for the same crime. It just doesn't work. Um, with presidential immunity, that is one where it's hard to imagine the Supreme Court isn't going to want to weigh in on that because this precise issue of presidential immunity in the criminal context as opposed to a civil context has not been decided by the Supreme Court. Um, so they are, I think, going to want to weigh in on it. And they understand the need to act expeditiously. Um, they have done that increasingly in the past. Um, obviously, they did it in the Nixon case, and that is a case that is cited repeatedly by the prosecution in their papers. One quick point. The newest member of the prosecution team is Michael Dreeben. He was the um, deputy solicitor general of the United States for decades. He has argued over a hundred times in the Supreme Court. The area that he specializes in is the criminal law. I have worked with him for many years. You do not get anyone more steeped in this issue. And he has thought about and written on this when he was the head legal officer in the special counsel Mueller investigation, where he wrote about this very issue. So Jack Smith has, you know, the A plus team in order um, for this argument before the Supreme Court. Time for tonight's episode of How to Do the Impossible, starring two people who do the impossible every six years by winning Senate seats in states where apparently no other Democrat seems to be able to win. As Politico notes, this isn't the first campaign that will force Senator John Tester and Senator Sherrod Brown to rely on their distinctive personalities and quasi-populist politics in the face of steep challenges. Both men won their second terms alongside former President Barack Obama, then won in pro-Trump states six years later. Each time, they defeated GOP challengers who tried to brand them as too liberal. The last Democratic presidential candidate to win Ohio was President Obama in his re-election campaign of 2012. President Obama actually also won Ohio in his first campaign in 2008. The last Democratic presidential candidate to win Montana was a guy named Bill Clinton, who won Montana in his first presidential campaign 31 years ago, uh, before many of these audience members were born, uh, Senator John Tester, just Senator, you were born before Sen that. yeah, right, just 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 a few years. You so know, in the good old days. Huh? So as the loneliest Democrat uh, on <laughs> on this panel, uh, everyone out there, whenever they see you guys, they're always wondering how do they do it? How do they do it? Uh, before we get to that, I want your assessment of what it's like to read how you do it from Politico and from these other places who think they've figured out how you do it. Well, look, uh, I, I don't usually read people's critiques <laughs> of how I do it because we know how we do it. And, and, uh, and I think Brown will tell you the same thing. It's about being who you are. It's about being real. It's about representing the people of your state. It's about leading. It's about uh, letting people know where you're from and uh, what your beliefs are. And what they've always tried to do to me is they've always tried to make me in something I'm not and try to beat that person uh, because they can't beat who I am. And, and that's a fact. And uh, now uh, Sherrod and I have got a pretty good track record on what we've done and accomplished in Congress over the last uh, many years. And we can talk about what we've accomplished. We can talk about who we are. We can talk about what we're going to do moving forward. But make no mistake about it. The playbook is going to be the same on their part. Try to make you into something he isn't so we can run against that guy. And my, my playbook is going to be the same. And I just talk about who I am and what I've done. I'm proud of my record. And uh, I'm proud of what I've done for Montana and the United States of America. Uh, how does it work in Ohio? Uh, the same. I mean, I, I think you go down in a dark hole if you start reading too many articles about yourself and, and look at too many opposition ads. And 
for me, as I've said on this show before, Lawrence, I, I wear this uh, pen. It's a depiction of a canary in a birdcage given to me at a Workers Memorial Day rally uh, 25 years ago. And um, it helps me focus on, you know, the story. The mine worker took the canary down in the mines, had no union in those days. It was strong enough for government that cared enough. And I, I, I noticed, and Chester doesn't do this, and I don't do this, but the first, your first week in the Senate, uh, they give you really this fancy, cool-looking, mm -hmm. expensive pen. People put it in their lapel. I'm pretty important. I'm a senator. Well, I, I wore that like three days, and I put the canary pen back on because it keeps your focus on where it ought to be. And one of the things is, one of the things I'm proudest of, and John's the chair of the Veterans Committee, I'm his sort of a lieutenant on that committee, and uh, we wrote more he than I, the PACT Act, which takes care of veterans. What we didn't do with Agent Orange a generation ago, if you're exposed to these football field-sized burn pits, you're, you get care from the VA. And uh, John wrote that bill. I helped him in that. It was named after an Ohio, and we both got the idea from talking to local people because he and I go home a lot of weekends, most weekends, and, and actually listen to people in the grocery store, him on his farm. Uh, me at, at a union hall, whatever, and it, it, it's it's how you win, and it's the way it's the best it's the best way to serve in this job. If you serve right, your chances of winning are much higher. By the way, uh, does sitting beside him make you feel lazy about the way you use your weekends compared to <laughs> this guy? Because I've seen the pictures of this guy on the weekends, on the summer well, well, recesses. Lawrence, you've seen he's the, in the dirt. Lawrence, <laughs> Lawrence, Lawrence, you've seen the pictures, but you haven't really seen him do that. And we still debate whether... Sorry to say this, hey, Brown, is he right? about okay. I have a garden, man. Does my garden count for nothing? Does his, <laughs> tell me how much, it, just garden? tell me how much his garden I'm counts not, to you. I am not sure he knows the difference between broccoli and cauliflower. I'm <laughs> yeah. just telling you. I, I worked in a family farm growing up. I used to milk dirt, uh, dirt Guernsey cows. That's good. I used to All shovel right. in the bar. I mean, I, I, I worked. I had a real job. Didn't pay much. But no, Chester, test, <laughs> he's one of the few people that goes home and actually has a, has a real job, too. I mean, I'm, my real job is representing people, and he does both. Does your style of campaigning work because you've got a relatively small population in Montana where you really can get out there to uh, to people in a way that's much more challenging in a, in a big population state like Ohio? Uh, I can't speak to that because I represent the state that I know and I know Montana. Mm -hmm. I can tell you that uh, Governor Schwinden back in the 80s would say every time you run a statewide election, you have looked or shook hands with everybody who's going to vote for you and against you. <laughs> and, and that's a fact because you, you, a state, a rural state like Montana forces you out to talk to people. But by the way, that's where you get your good ideas. That's how you can come back to Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. and get, get good legislation passed. It's talking to the guys that are on the ground that are trying to make a living, trying to make the books balance that say, hey, you know, if you do this or you do that, it would certainly help us out. And then you take those ideas back and, uh, you know, try to get Brown to sign on as a co-sponsor and you're off and running. And we've got dueling lapel pins here, I see. What, what's the, what's your... This is, this is Toys for Tots. It's a, okay. a little thing that the... It's a little weird in March when he wears Toys for yeah. Tots. <laughs> I've always been like Mike Kerry. <laughs> yeah. So, so Brown doesn't wear his Senate pin. I lost mine. I mean, you know, I mean, what can I say? John, John, John had a bad crop yield one year and he sold his kids <laughs> underpin. That's, That's really what happened. Uh, so on issues, you... you, you talked about issues right away as you're talking here and you're describing things you've done and you say that here the way apparently you say it in Ohio and somehow voters actually listen to you because Joe Biden has more accomplishments to bring to voters than any any Democratic president of my lifetime. Voters don't know he did that, apparently. The voters he needs, the voters in Ohio he needs, don't know he did that. What's, what's the gap of, that's going on there between Joe Biden's accomplishments, voters' understanding of it, versus, say, your accomplishments and the way you get voters to understand that? Well, part of it on the, on the PACT Act is I, I've been in 41 counties of the 88, I think, just in the last year since PACT Act passed. I'll go to a VFW or a Legion Hall or or an AMVETS Hall or a Polish American Veterans Hall and sit for an hour and a half with 15 veterans around the table and asking them really to get the word out that this, that how important this is. And they have many, uh, call it many friends, veterans friends that, that can sign up. But it's also um, being very public about whose side you on. And as you know, um, Ohio legislature passed a six-week abortion ban. They call it the heartbeat bill. It essentially banned abortion. 700,000 Ohioans signed petitions. Uh, the Republican Secretary of State tried to disqualify all kinds of signatures. They they called a new issue on the ballot to force a 60 percent versus a 50 percent threshold. We won on that, and, and it passed by 
13 points. And you can bet next year the three Republicans who want my seat that are going to be running in the primary, every one of them has called for a national abortion ban. So we will make that contrast clear. John calls it freedom. In Montana, I call it, uh, I want women and their doctors to make that choice, not a bunch of politicians in Columbus. Uh, but I think we, we understand. We, we just, John and I know the, know our state so much better always than the people that run against us. And we know, we know how to talk to them. We know how more importantly to listen to them. And I think that's what really counts. In the